welcome to The Room to Write. Uh, this is our story, Journey of a Story series, and today we're going to be talking to Abatina Delafano Murano, and she goes by Del for short, and she did an amazing job uh, illustrating the life of her family, and that's something that we're all very interested in, in our own lives, is finding out about our genealogy and uh, telling the stories of our ancestors. So uh, I'd like to introduce you to Dell, and uh, maybe we'll just start off by uh, asking you, how did you, you know, where are you in your family? Uh, do you have siblings? And how were you the one to uh, create this wonderful book, Fading Shadows, uh, about your family story? It came slowly. It was not intentional. I never dreamed of, I would write. But I came from a large family, and I was the tenth, the eleventh child. And uh, I had to learn a lot about what happened before I was born. Hmm. So I would ask my older siblings. And a little at a time, I would be receiving responses. And though I was young and small, and almost oblivious, somehow I harvested all the responses that my siblings would tell me about your mother, your, what your father, and all the other siblings, what they did, who died, who was sick. And I just didn't understand. But when I got older, I started to piece it together. And I said, geez, what kind of a life my father lived? my mother lived. It was, it was exciting, but then it was tragic, hmm. I thought. So I just jotted down a few notes, but then the few notes grew into a page. And then maybe a week later, it would grow into a chapter. And I says, oh, why don't I record what little I know? And so I did, and the book was born. And I think that it's important to uh, let our viewers know uh, a little bit into your story, maybe why you were so curious when you were younger. Did you know your mother or did you not know your mom? What was sort of the backdrop of no, why I, you I want was, to know? No, I was the 11th child born to a mother I never knew. And I wanted to make sure I honored her with my father. Although my father's the main character, he he later became the mom and dad to a large family. And so you never and met your mom? No. Eventually, she was sick and in and out of the hospital. And she had a terrible um, high blood pressure. And though, though they knew of it, they didn't know how to treat it. Mm. And eventually, she died from a cerebral hemorrhage. She had a stroke in the brain. Um, six of us, the, young, the six youngest ones were taken away and we went into foster homes and I wound up in Lowell. Okay. That's when I wrote the story about the memoir oh. when I was three years old. My father would come to see us and he picked me up and put me on his knee and I was so happy. <laughs> and he says, God took your mum away. He says, but don't be frightened, he says. He says, but he'll take care of you. And for whatever it's worth, I, I believe. That's all. I had nothing else to worry about. Mm -hmm. But then I get ill. And I came down with what they call the measles, the real measles. And the woman of the house, she was told by the doctor to put me in a room, for, a dark room for 11 days because that type of measles would affect your eyesight. She had a huge home, one of those old homes in Lowell. And one day she took me for my hand, she took me for a walk through her huge place, which to me looked like the whole world. And now uh, she's going in and out of little corridors and hallways, and she's talk she's thinking, but she's talking out loud where she what room she'll choose for me. And then she had a little back room that she used as a sewing room. And then she was kind of pleased with herself. And she said, yeah, 
I'll put you here. She looked down at me, and I'm looking up at her. And she says, I'll put you here for 11 days, and you'll be all right. Wow. How old were you? Do I you was remember? three years old. Oh, wow. That much I know. And she put me in this dark room and drew all the shades down so there was no light. And I, I had all the time in the world to look around that little room. And I looked at every nook and cranny of that room. I knew I saw a bookcase. I saw a desk. I saw a, a coat hanger, a coat rack. And I thought the room was nice, it was dark, it was cozy, and I was content. And then one day, something happened. I must have been asleep, and then I was aroused from my sleep. And there was this woman standing in front of my little cot with her arms wide open, with her palms toward me. And that was it. I, I saw that figure, and she vanished. But before she vanished, she says, don't be frightened, be brave. And I must have fallen back to sleep. And then eventually, I thought more about it. And I says, I wonder, I wonder, through the passing years, if she wasn't the, my true mother watching over me, hmm. or was she an angel sent to comfort me? And, and I, that story grew into my memoir. Wow. It stayed with me. <clears throat> and you can, I mean, I can feel you're a writer, <laughs> just in the way you describe a room and the, the details that I'm, you put into it. I, I think when I write, I'm passionate because I'm, I'm there. You, you write what you feel, mm -hmm. and I was the little one that was in that room with this woman who was standing in front of me. I wasn't scared. I think I was, I was a baby, and I was too young to be scared. Right. But wow. that's how that came about. And so I think I put that in the book, too. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, it's so important to, you know, there's so many stories that are real stories. There's, and so, I think <laughs> there's so much wrapped up into that book. Right. Of through the years of her, my mother and my father, and my brothers and sisters, all the Ill with children, there's always illnesses of some sort. Right. And there was plenty in the book. And so, in addition to just um, you know slowly piecing stories from your siblings together, uh, what are some other? Was that the, the sole basis of how you wrote, or did you do any research into your family history or? No. Uh, was it all word of mouth? All, all whatever I heard from my ten siblings. Wow. <laughs> and did any of them have different memories? Did they ever say, well, "Oh one, no, it was it, like it, this"? It or? seemed like what I'd get them if if I caught them alone. I'd ask questions. They probably looked down at this little runt asking questions. <laughs> I had no reason. I mean, I I wasn't thinking of anything to write a book. Never dreamed that I'd write a book. It just came together by itself. And so how old were you, or what part of your life were you in when you said, you know what, I have all these stories. Now, you stored them just up in your head, right? And I wondered. Uh, and when did you decide, I'm going to take a pen, or I'm going to you know, get my computer or typewriter out, and I'm going to start to put these together? When did that I started happen? putting thoughts down. Back, back in when those you were days, an adult? It was on a floppy disk. Okay. Uh, and I would put the, I'd have a file for collections of thoughts. And then there became so many. I said, this could write into a story. Right. And then I got excited about it and started to write. But then I'd stop. So um, it took me about 18 years yeah. before I decided to do anything with it. Wow. And my, I would send little, every time I upgraded something, I would send it to my oldest son. What do you think? What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. And he had filed it away. And I said, well, wait till I really, wait till I really say what I want to say. I didn't want him to think that was it. But he was, he used to take everything that I said, or sent him, and, and put it in a fi his file. So I'd say to him, do you know what I did with chapter 14? And then he <laughs> would go and go get 14. And so did you find that you were able to write honestly? I mean, you had a hard life, and your family went through really difficult times. Yeah. And so did you, was there ever a point where you felt like you needed to tell the whole truth 
about some of the more difficult details or did you always feel like writing was just an honest expression of, of your family? I started learning about the family when I was about 16, when my father was able to take his three little girls home. Okay. Six were taken away, but three boys were able to go back to Boston. And then later, one of my brothers got married, and they lived with my father because we, the city of Boston said we had to have a female in the house before we could take the little girls home. Wow, those were the years, huh? And because <laughs> he married and there was a woman in the house, she was, the, she, it was all right, she was like the chaperone. So three of us came home, and Julie, was fortunate enough to be able to, she wanted to be a nurse and she did become one. And then she became a practical nurse. And my other sister, Florence, I call her Flo. And then myself. So I was 16, there was 16, 17, 18 years old. And that's when I started to ask questions. I says, but who, when did she die, I'd say, and I'd then if I, I caught my father at lunchtime, and I'd be asking him questions. But then I couldn't ask him anymore because he was, looked like he was sad, talking about <clears throat> my mother, his wife. I could never say my mother because I didn't know her. Hmm. But he felt bad about that too. But I got the answers that I wanted, and that's when I started compiling everything. And were you com starting to compile it in writing at that point? Uh, no, no, Still I didn't. Still in your head? I never had a computer when I was 16. Okay. But I harvested all those thoughts. <laughs> I said, someday, someday I'll put it down on paper. Okay, and when was someday? Do you remember? I was old. I was probably off and on. I mean, it took so, so long. I didn't write steadily. I was probably 50. Okay. I know that's young. Yeah, that is But uh, then I got interested in other activities of my life. And then the, bo the babies were born, 59 and 60. And I started to write heavily then. Until... So until when you said 50, you mean 1950? Maybe, maybe when so I was... So you were 25? The thought was in my head. Okay. Uh, I have it all that time. But you weren't 50 years old. You meant you started. No, I think I was. Or were you 50? I didn't really do anything until 1982. Okay. When my oldest boy left home to, for his job. He, he, gave, he sent me, uh, he came home for the holiday, and he gave me my first little computer. Years and years ago, it was a Commodore with Commodore floppy disks. Commodore 64, disc. I had one of those. <laughs> floppy disk. And I thought that was, the, that was, that was it. Yep. I got the whole world right here. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do with it. He says, oh, Mom, just sit there. He says, you, you see what happens. So when the time came for him to leave, he had to go back to New Jersey. I'm sitting at the computer, and it didn't do anything. So about 2 in the morning, I called him. I said, Dave, I'm sitting by the computer, but it didn't do anything. He said, tell me, what are you doing? I said, I'm sitting here like you told me. <laughs> he, says, he said, you have to do something. <laughs> and that started everything. Nice. When I saw that what I did on the keyboard came out on the, on the monitor, I, like the whole world opened up. Right. And so you never thought to just write it in pen, in longhand, on paper? No. Before no. that? Okay. And I think, you know, I, I, I want to... I put everything on floppy disk then. I, I, I thought, oh, I thought this was it. Right. Well, and I, I, there's a detail that you talk about that I think is worth mentioning again, and that is that you didn't start to write the story down until after your son was moved out. You know, a lot I of, was, you know, people my age that have young children and you know, we feel we want to get to the craft of writing, we want to, you know, tell our stories, and uh, you don't have to do it all at once. Uh, and I think that's something that's an important message these yeah. days, is gradually, you have time. Gradually, it became a book. I didn't know it was going to be 
so I didn't know it was going to be difficult because I was up to almost 700 pages. Wow, and that's the book. It's and that's one. the book. But I brought it down, I think, to 500 or 600 pages so I could manage it. Mm -hmm. But I had to cut out a lot. And so how did you go about planning how you were going to set up the book and what were you going to include and in breaking it into chapters? Was, was there like a, a process that you went through to do that or how did that unfold? Well, when I really got serious about it, I had to think of a title. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to encompass everything that was in the book. And the only way I could do that, which I fell in love with the feather, and I put the feather in the book, and then I had to think about the color, and I wanted it to be pink. I loved pink. And then I positively wanted a shadow, so I figured the feather would be the brevity of life, and the color of pink would be the energy and the zest of the youth, and the shadow would be would depict the trials and tragedies that everybody will eventually experience. Mm -hmm. That's how I got the feather. So you came up with the title, and then you sort Fading of took Shadows. It so three, it was three in one, and I was happy. When the publisher showed me what, the, what it would look like, I said, a great big capital, go. I says, go. <laughs> So how did you decide you were going to publish it, this, and how did you find your publisher, and, and what I was that a, process? I met a woman who published a book, a, a little one, and she was excited about it. Mm -hmm. She said she, she and her husband took a trip in a car, for a journey in a car. They lived there, whatever. I never d had that experience, so I can't speak of it. Mm -hmm. But she was so excited about the fact that she just published this little book I got thinking about that. I says, oh, maybe that's what I should do. And that's how it came about. And so did you go with the same publisher she had? Did she? I did. OK. And what was, how did you, how did you do that? Is that online or? <coughs> well, I was getting a lot of ads and emails about publishers that I, I didn't know one from the other. Right. So I just chose one and follow the, whatever they were going to do for me. Mm -hmm. And it didn't cost very much. So again, I didn't, I, 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 never, know, I, didn't, I never know what's coming up. Everything's like a surprise. <coughs> Sorry. I consider everything an adventure. Right. <laughs> well, I think that must be what got you through what seemed like really difficult years. And so this story talks about your dad coming over from Italy. Yeah. Um, I don't yeah. know if you want to talk I wrote about myself, that a little bit. I wrote myself some notes about him because he, he was really one of the main characters. I wrote, this is about Michael. My father's name was Michael, and this is what I wrote. This character is a gripping tale of a young man's unforgettable journey of self-discovery and overcoming the trauma and personal tragedies. It's a story of love, prayer, hardship, persistence, and an overwhelming joy where the character learns he can be anything that he can imagine. And I mentioned about the hardest part of the book was to learn about my ca the characters of the book. And I tell you that my father loved what he loved to do, but he wanted more. And editing the original <coughs> manuscript, as I mentioned before, 700 pages, and wow. I brought it down to a more manageable size of 500. And I didn't have anything special of, there was no particular character that was outstanding except him. And I'd say their whole life was a drama. Of my mother's name was Philomena. I want to mm. make sure that's honoring her. And their lives were exciting and tragic. It was like a movie, yet it was extremely real. These are the stories I've been told from my older siblings how their parents, my parents lived. And then I think one of the questions that you asked me was, 
what would I like to leave, or what would I like the readers to take away from the book that they read? And I, I think besides being grateful for the opportunity to sit here and speak about my book, I think being well and mentally healthy would be more, more important than almost anything. That would be, I think, my takeaway. And the inspiration was from my father. Uh, and I, I, I learned learning what my parents went through and how they dealt with their problems mm. as to the, how people deal today. Michael went from where he was and saw the reality of pursuing his dream. And his dream was to come to America. And I mean, it's amazing too that your dad shared so many details with you because a lot of times that generation, I know from my family, you know, well, you don't have too many stories coming out. This didn't come strictly from him because I had older brothers mm -hmm. and they probably asked questions. I don't know. I don't know about them. But when I did, I would ask my older siblings. And when I got a chance, my father had to work most of the time. Mm -hmm. I would ask him, so I, that's what I gathered together, and that's what I harvested in my head, the life that they lived. And did they, um, any of their family come over here, or did you ever go back to Italy to meet any of your other relatives, or uh, where, are, are there any other connections, or was your dad and mom here all by themselves? They were by themselves. Yeah. They started their, fa when they, my father, they, when they came from Italy, they had one son born in Italy, one brother, and the other 10 were born here. Wow. So that was a hard life, and it wasn't easy because uh, he spoke broken English, and people had a, had a hard time understanding him. Mm. And that's why maybe today <coughs> we have to be patient with those who try to speak with us and they have broken English. Right. And do you, you know, are there any sort of connections you draw when you think about your dad and your mom coming over here and the, you know, immigration being such a, a topic now and people being intolerant and yet, like you're saying, you know, a lot of us, we came from immigrant parents or grandparents. Um, how was that for your dad? How was that transition? Did he ever talk about that? He was a very vivacious guy. He was, he didn't know what he was in for, but he was <laughs> anxious to go to America. And she, from what I understand, my mother had a hard time because she loved, she loved Italy. And she never traveled more than five, 10 feet away from home. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden she's gonna get on a big ship, come to America. Uh, so it was hard for her, right. but it was a thrill for my father. Mm. And then the, the, the sighting at Ellis Island was more enjoyable because there were throngs of people and they had to find each other. When Michael came off the ship and she was, at, my mother, I understand, was accompanied with one boy, the boy that was born in Italy, uh, and then my father had a friend who wanted to come to Italy, Italy with him, and he did. Uh, so it, finally, when she heard his calling her, she said through the crowd, and then the boy, it's in the book. You have to read the book to understand it. Mm -hmm. The book says, Mama, where's my father? And when she spotted him in the crowd, she said, he's all right over there. And that must have been the thrill for that kid. Mm. That's my father. Right. Um, yeah, so. I'm very, very grateful <clears throat> for being here with you. Well, uh, we're grateful that you came in to share your story. Imagine, and, I, I um, have a chance to speak of what's in the book, but there's so much more that we may not have time to, to divulge. Right, and we don't, you know, we always run out of time. Um, but I think it's important, if nothing else, to encourage people to write their stories down. 
I uh, think no so. matter how old they are or how young they are, you know, whether it's on a Commodore 64 they'll, or they'll a long run, hand. They'll run into um, writer's block. Because I think, you know, in, in part of when you were talking about your memories and all the details that go, went into those memories, uh, I think we take for granted some of the details in our own environment right now. And yet in 40 years, it'll be interesting to somebody to understand where we are right now. So uh, I appreciate you coming in. And uh, I didn't know if you wanted to leave any last uh, advice to people who are hesitant to write down their family story or their life story, uh, any maybe uh, writing tips or uh, prompts that you could, advice you could offer them of how to start and how to do that? I don't know if it's advice or wisdom, if I have either. <clears throat> but I think something will gnaw at you. Something will come up. And then you'll think about it, and you may do as I did, just harvest the thought, or you may take action, and you may start to write. At first, it's a thrill. And then when you really get into it, it becomes more difficult. Mm. But it's exciting, no matter what. If you've started a book, and you're thinking about it, I think you should carry it on, and be persistent, and persevere, and finish your story, be it your father or a trip you took or something else. But I think, I think it's important, if it's your family, put it down on paper. <clears throat> Sorry. This well, is the moment. There are no more. This is it. Thank you. We'll leave it on that. That's inspirational if I ever heard of it. Thank you so much, Adele, for coming in and talking to us and sharing your story. It was my pleasure, <laughs> my excitement, my adventure. Thank you. And for anyone else who would like to come in and share the story of their writing and join us in the studio, please welcome to come in and look up on www.theroomtowrite.org and uh, see you next time. Mm -hmm.